We'll continue our series on the Bible, how God gave it and how we ought to receive it. So first, we're uh, looking at this section of history, which is uh, answering the question, how did God give us the Bible? And so just to review, we looked at how God gave the, uh, the first five books of the Bible to Moses, and uh, those are written down and kept in the, uh, the tabernacle. Uh, the tabernacle was the central repository for sacred scripture. And uh, in Moses' day, uh, that's when God gave him the pattern of the tabernacle, and they built that. And, uh, and he wrote down uh, his five books and put it there with the ark, and also, uh, you remember the two tablets written with the finger of God. Those were in the ark. And then after Moses, of course, Joshua also wrote scripture. We read that in the book of Joshua. And after him, we see this man, Samuel, who was the last of the judges. And he, uh, it appears, was the one who recorded the history of the judges. Samuel grew up in the tabernacle and... Uh, after the death of Samuel, uh, he recorded uh, the acts of uh, King David. And uh, after, after that, uh, other prophets took up the work of recording about the kings. David himself wrote scriptures, the Psalms, uh, many of those. And Solomon also wrote, uh, of course, those Proverbs that were collected into the book of Proverbs, but also Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. And in Solomon's day, the temple was built, the first temple. And that became the new central repository for sacred scripture. But at the time of Solomon, the, uh, right after his death, the kingdom was divided into those northern ten tribes of Israel and the southern two tribes of Judah. And uh, in both cases, they went off very early into idolatry. And so God was going to bring judgment upon Israel and Judah, and he began to warn them. He began to send prophets. So some of those prophets that were sent to the northern ten tribes were Amos and Hosea and Micah. And also the prophet Jonah uh, was uh, ministered to the uh, Israelite kings. And these writings were collected as scripture. And uh, of course we know ultimately Israel went into uh, captivity. It was, uh, Samaria fell to the Assyrians. And so that left Judah. And the situation was only slightly better there. And from the time of their first king, Rehoboam, Judah also had practiced idolatry and abomination. And so prophets were sent to warn Judah Nevertheless, it was different in the southern two tribes because some of the later kings were faithful to the Lord. And so there were these periods of reformation, and that's what we're going to look at uh, today. The first of these great periods of reformation happened under the king Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the 13th king of Judah, and uh, he arose at a time where Israel, uh, Judah was in sad shape. His father Ahaz had closed the temple, cut in pieces its vessels, and built idolatrous altars throughout Jerusalem and Judah. Closed up the temple. And this is what Hezekiah was born into. But Hezekiah's first priority as king was to reopen and repair the temple. Uh, we read that in 2 Chronicles. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord, that's speaking of the temple, and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. So not only was there uh, idolatry happening outside the, the temple, but even things had been brought into the temple. And so Hezekiah said, get those out, carry all the filthiness out of the holy place. 
And so uh, the temple was repaired and restored. And among many other of these reforms that came in Hezekiah's day, he also reinstituted the use of music in worship. And that was first pioneered by David. He had written those, uh, those first psalms and then also gave instructions for how the musicians were to, uh, to play and to sing the psalms. And Hezekiah restored this. We read here, And he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with psalteries, and with harps, according to the commandment of David, and of Gad the king's seer, and Nathan the prophet. Moreover, Hezekiah the king and the princes commanded the Levites to sing praise to, unto the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. And they sang praises with gladness, and they bowed their heads and worshipped. So that's a picture of this musical worship that's going on uh, under Hezekiah. And that reference to singing with the words of David and of Asaph the seer, that's speaking about the book of Psalms. That's what they had and they were singing from. Those were the words of David. You see some of the Psalms were also written by Asaph. Now this is interesting because Hezekiah himself may have composed one or more of the many anonymous songs collected in the book of Psalms. You might say, why would you think that? Well, there's a little uh, hint to, the, to Hezekiah composing songs that he uh, records in his writing after he was healed of his sickness here in Isaiah 38. This is the writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness. He said this, the Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. That seems to indicate that Hezekiah's songs were sung in the temple and very well may have been collected into the book of Psalms. You see how many anonymous song, uh, psalms there are in that book. We don't know, certainly. But also, in addition to advancing the use of psalms in temple worship, Hezekiah also sponsored the collection of additional Proverbs of Solomon. Do you remember how many Proverbs that Solomon had wrote, had written? 3,000. And it's not 3,000 uh, verses in the book of Proverbs. So the work of collecting and editing these Proverbs was ongoing. You say, how do you know that? Well, if you read in the book of Proverbs, you come across this. These are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. Hezekiah's men, uh, under his command, are copying out. Uh, additional Proverbs, and those were incorporated into the book that we have today. Sadly, the reforms that came under Hezekiah turned out to be short-lived. Uh, he was succeeded by his son Manasseh, and that was uh, another era of unfaithfulness in Judah. Manasseh was a wicked king who in his 55-year reign ushered in this unprecedented era of idolatry and temple desecration. So if you thought that what Ahaz had done to the temple was bad, Manasseh went even further. And it was uh, a very uh, severe apostasy that happened in his rule. We read this about Manasseh. This, the scriptures... Uh, are very graphic in what Manasseh did. They tell us this. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem, but did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down, and reared up altars for Baalim, that means all those false Baals, and made groves, uh, places and instruments for idolatrous worship, and worshiped all the host of heaven and served them. What is that speaking of? That means they were worshiping the sun and the moon and the stars. Uh, that was a common theme in pagan worship. And Manasseh brought it all in. Everything he could find, apparently to bring in. Not only that, also he built altars in the house of the Lord. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Manasseh built these false idolatrous altars right in the temple. And they were not just there alone, but they were attended to by these idolatrous priests in the temple of the Lord. And 
he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Uh, this uh, infanticide that went along with so much of the pagan worship, Manasseh was first in line to take in part in that. Also he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. These are all the things that were prohibited in the law of Moses. And uh, it would have been difficult to break more of these violations than what Manasseh did here. If you were setting out to overturn everything that the Lord had said, that's what he did. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And finally he says this, and he said a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, raised up an idol in the temple. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. In other words, God brought the Israelites in and destroyed all these heathen. And he said they even went further than they did. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. They wouldn't heed the word of the Lord. And so that brings us, uh, we read all of that because that gives us important context for what's going to happen next. Because the next round of reforms is going to be spearheaded by this King Josiah. Following uh, Manasseh and then the short reign of his son Amon, Manasseh's grandson, Josiah, became king. And he, as a young man, King Josiah began to seek after the God of David his father. That's what we read. And uh, it's somewhat uh, a mystery how exactly Josiah was brought to understand about the Lord, but he did. And he began to seek after him. And he began to make these reforms again. Josiah embarked on a campaign to rid Judah and Jerusalem of all these idols that his father had built. And not only that, Josiah burned the bones of the idolatrous priests on their altars and destroyed everything associated with the worship of false gods throughout Judah. He was very diligent in re restoring the true worship of the true God. Like his great-grandfather great Hezekiah, King Josiah also began to repair the temple. That was a, the next thing on the list. Once we've brought these uh, false idols to nothing, now we need to restore and uh, repair all this damage and desecration that had been done to the house of the Lord. And in the course of repairing the temple, an extraordinary discovery was made. And this is what's relevant to our study here of the Bible. We read this. And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes. He tore them in a sign of grief. And the king commanded, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. So a book was discovered in the renovations of the temple. And this raises many questions. The first question is, what was the book that was found? Uh, all that it's called here in these uh, scriptures that relate the event is that it's called the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Now, uh, the most popular explanation is that this was a copy of the book of Deuteronomy. And that certainly could be. Um, that would explain uh, why Josiah rent his clothes. Because you see, in Deuteronomy, they are recorded all the curses that would fall upon Israel if they fell into idolatry. Um, nevertheless, 
It may be more than merely a copy of Deuteronomy. It's possible that it could be a copy of the entire Torah, the entire five books of Moses. This phrase, the book of the law of the Lord, is used elsewhere in the Old Testament, not just to refer to Deuteronomy, but the whole Torah. But there's another possibility uh, that would explain the significance of this find. Is it possible that they found the very copy of the Torah that Moses had written and placed with the ark in the holy place. Not just a copy, the copy, the original. That's a very uh, interesting possibility. That would explain also why this was uh, an event of such magnitude, is that they found it. Well, that leads us to the next question. Why then did Josiah tear his clothes? Uh, of course, we know that's a sign of, of grief, and he was uh, afflicted uh, by the disobedience that had uh, gone on in Judah. And he knew that judgment was going to fall. But why was it that he tore his clothes in this way? Because when we read it, Josiah's reaction suggests that he was then unfamiliar with the book, at least in its entirety. This, I think we're, we're intended to, to gather from the way this is written, that some of these things Josiah is hearing for the first time, or at minimum, he's hearing them in a, in a different way than he's heard them before. Evidently, he hadn't copied out the entire Torah as the Israelite kings were required to do. You remember that? That was in the law. Every king was to copy their own personal copy. And yet Josiah seems to be unfamiliar with at least some portions that he heard here. Nevertheless, Josiah had known enough to destroy the idols and to repair the temple. How did he know that? I think if you bring all this together, uh, probably the, the best that we can say here is, despite a degree of the knowledge of the Lord at this time, the emphasis that had once been placed on the scriptures had been greatly weakened during the reigns of Manasseh and Ammon. Again, this is over a 50-year period of apostasy. And then that leads us to the question, how was the book lost in the first place? How was it that how could the priests, they had one job to keep the, the law of the Lord. How was it that they lost this book? Well, um, first off, it seems clear, this book had never left the temple. It's not like this book was found. We found it in the cave over here. No, it was in the temple. <clears throat> it had been there the whole time. So it wasn't lost in the sense that it was gone. It's possible, was it perhaps mislaid? If you have a, a library or an archive, sometimes if you don't know where to find something, that's as good as uh, it being lost. And that happens in libraries even today. Uh, there are items that are mislaid and then suddenly someone finds it and said, oh, this is what was in the card catalog and we didn't even know where it was. That's a possibility. Think about this. What were copies of Scripture being deliberately destroyed during Judah's recent idolatry? Think about this. If you set up an idol in the midst of the house of the Lord and you have all the priests attending this false worship, what would they do if they found this book that had all these uh, stringent judgments upon idolaters and what was to be done? You'd probably get rid of it. You'd probably begin to destroy it. And uh, we're in the realm of supposition here, but no doubt that was happening uh, in the midst of this apostasy. And so what else what might we think about how this book was lost? Is it possible that copies of Scripture were hidden away by the faithful priests and the Levites? That copy of the law of the Lord they saw to be very precious, and they saw that the enemies of the Lord were at hand, and so they secreted it away somewhere in the temple, between some stones or uh, in a foundation, in, the, in a floor. We don't, we don't know. That, and that's what they seem to have come across when they were renovating the temple. Nevertheless, the discovery of this book of the law supercharged the reforms that Josiah was already implementing. You see, he was already uh, being very zealous for the Lord. But once he had the book of the law and he was reading it, and he said, we need to do this. We need to obey what the Lord has said. We see that uh, he did carry out the commands of the, 
the book because they observed the Passover. It says, there was no Passover like to that kept in Israel from the days of Samuel the prophet. Neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Josiah kept and the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel that were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That means that uh, Josiah observed this great Passover to a T as it was instructed in the law of the Lord. And this is a, this is a great lesson to us. Josiah was obedient in what he knew to do. That's when he began to tear down the false idols. He was faithful. And in response, the Lord revealed more about what he should do. That happens in our own lives. Are there things we don't understand about the scriptures? Certainly there are. But are we faithful in what we do know? How can we expect God to reveal himself to us in what we don't know if we're not even following what we do know? Let's follow Josiah's example. Be obedient in what we know, and the Lord will reveal more. Like Hezekiah, an important part of Josiah's reforms was this advancement of the use of music in temple worship. We see that again. They bring it back. And so this may have included the composition and collection of additional songs in the book of Psalms. Uh, we don't have the details, but that could have been happening here again in, in this time. Nevertheless, judgment was going to fall on Judah. And they were, they were warned of that. Uh, right after they found this book of the law of the Lord, he said, and go inquire of the Lord uh, concerning the words of this book. They went to the prophetess Huldah, and this is what she said. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the curses that are written in the book which they have read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be poured out upon this place and shall not be quenched. So prophets were continuing to warn Judah. The same thing that happened to Israel will happen here if you do not repent. And uh, some of these prophets who warned Judah were Isaiah. He warned uh, Judah in the reigns of Isaiah and Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah. Also Micah prophesied in the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Nahum appears to have prophesied at this same time. And then among those latter kings of of Judah. Jeremiah prophesied during the reigns of Josiah and then the last four kings of Judah. And Zephaniah also prophesied in the reign of Josiah. It seems Habakkuk probably uh, fits into this time period as well. What were some of these warnings? We have a, a, a very graphic picture of these warnings being written down in the book of Jeremiah. We read this, And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel, and against Judah, and against all the nations, from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. Now, this was a period of some 20 years. And the Lord says, all this prophecy that I've given to you, you need to commit that to writing. And so he did. The Lord says, it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. So the Lord's looking for repentance. And so Jeremiah carries out this instruction. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah. And Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord, which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of, the, of a book. And again, this is uh, not the, the kind of uh, book that we're used to, but this seems to indicate a scroll that they were writing in. And uh, we see that Jeremiah is not himself moving the pen, but uh, this scribe Baruch is writing as Jeremiah is dictating the word of the Lord. Uh, you know, that's the same way that other scriptures are written. Uh, Paul in some of his letters said, 
I'm dictating this to, to people. Nevertheless, it was the word of the Lord. So they wrote this down. And then Jeremiah sent Baruch to read this book publicly in the temple. And so he was going to read all the warnings from God. And then someone overheard that. And some officials of Judah then asked Baruch to read the book to them private. They said, come over here and read us this book. And then they took the book to King Jehoiakim and read it to him. And Jehoiakim was not a good king. He was involved in this idolatry. He was promoting it. So he did not like the message that God had sent. We read this. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudai had read three or four leaves, he cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. These words of the Lord are being read to King Jehoiakim. And as he reads two or three columns of text, the king takes a knife and cuts it off and throws it in the fire. And the scribe reads more. And then he cuts them off and throws them in the fire until the whole book was con consumed. All this uh, summation of Jeremiah's decades-long ministry. But that's not the end uh, of these writings. After King Jehoiakim burned the book, the Lord told Jeremiah, write a second copy. We see that. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after that the king had burned the roll, saying, take thee again another roll and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, hath burned. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire. And there were added besides unto them many like words. So uh, we see Jeremiah dictates essentially the second expanded edition of this warning. He says, you're not only going to have these words, but I'm going to add even more words to them. Uh, the word of the Lord uh, will not be stopped, will not be silenced. Uh, the kings of the earth uh, are powerless to oppose it. Now, the, uh, these warnings came to pass. They prophesied about the destruction of Judah and the destruction of Jerusalem. And in 586 B.C., that's exactly what happened. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians swept in. And uh, there were several rounds of deportations made. And finally, in 586, Jerusalem, the city, fell. And the temple was destroyed. And this was one of the greatest tragedies in the, the history of Israel, was the destruction of Jerusalem. So everything that they had been warned about came to pass. And then what happened to the word of the Lord after that? You see, there's this great judgment that fell upon Judah, but what's the rest of the story? Well, that brings us to the exilic prophets. That means the prophets who wrote in exile or um, in the captivity. There were still prophets writing then. So... Jeremiah was lapped right over into this because you see he wrote the book. Uh, you see that in the end of Jeremiah, descriptions of the destruction of Jerusalem, but also lamentations. What is that book other than a lamentation for the great destruction that has fallen upon Jerusalem and Judah? And uh, Obadiah, that seems to have been written here. It's not quite as explicit, but you see o Obadiah is prophesying against the Edomites and how that they were... Uh, uh, they did not come to the aid. They were rejoicing in the destruction of Jerusalem. Ezekiel, he was one who had been brought in some of those earlier rounds of deportation into Babylon. And he was there and uh, we not too long ago had to study through the book of Ezekiel. And the Lord used him as an object lesson of this judgment that was coming. And even it seems in real time when Babylon, when Jerusalem was falling, the Lord was giving Ezekiel these prophecies saying, this day Jerusalem fell. Also, the prophet Daniel is writing during this time. You see, he was one of those uh, young Hebrew children that was brought out into Babylon in an earlier phase. 
But that raises this question. If the first temple was destroyed, well, what happened to the copies of scriptures kept in the first temple? Was this the end of the scriptures? Well, we have evidence that the scriptures continue to be copied and read. We know that because Daniel had copies of scriptural, scripture. He wrote this. In the first year of Darius, the son of Hazuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books. He had access to books. And what did he understand? The number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So now Daniel is looking at the time period following the destruction of Jerusalem, and he's trying to understand what's next. And he reads in the book of Jeremiah. We read this also that Daniel writes, Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. So not only did he have Jeremiah, he had the law of Moses. He could see what was happening. Uh, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. So we see from this that Daniel had books that included the prophecy of Jeremiah as well as the law of Moses. You see, Daniel had been deported years earlier. And so what does that mean? That means that the copies of these scriptures were taken along with the Jews from Babylon even before the temple was destroyed. There were more copies being made, and that's how Daniel had access to his. And even if you think about the... Uh, destruction of the temple. Um, there may have been reason that the Babylonians would have uh, spared the writings. The Babylonians loved knowledge and books, and they would have uh, perhaps taken those and kept them, put them it up in their treasury. Think also about what happened in some of those earlier rounds. Before the temple was itself destroyed, they took out the vessels of the temple. There was already a, a somewhat of a ransacking of the temple, and, a, and uh, some of those scriptures may have ended up in a library in Babylon. Uh, nevertheless, we know that Daniel had access to them, and among others. And it's also interesting that uh, Daniel even had access to the writing of his contemporary Jeremiah. I mean, their lives overlapped, and yet even in that early phase, you see Jeremiah's writings beginning to be circulated as scripture. That's the same thing that we saw that when Moses uh, wrote, did anyone have any doubt that this was scripture? No, it was treat, treated as scripture even from the beginning. Um, you know, if you talk to skeptical scholars today, they say, well, you know, they had all these writings and then hundreds of years later, they came together and decided which ones are scripture. No, that's not how it operated. As each prophet was writing, those scriptures were immediately canonized and recognized as scripture. They were protected. They were entrusted to that repository. So uh, we find that the scriptures were preserved even in the exile. So they continue to be preserved even in the captivity. We'll have to end there this morning, but next time we'll speak about what happens next because uh, these uh, uh, children of Israel from Judah, return to the land. And then we have more writings that happen then. And uh, we'll see even uh, about those silent years. And we have some clues about what happened to the scriptures in those years. All right, thank you for your attention.